You get this whirling dervish of birds. Today on This American Land, loud and mesmerizing, geese cover the skies on a stopover to their breeding grounds. For some dedicated bird watchers, it's like a family reunion. Okay, all the warriors, let's have you over here. They defended this land, now it's their time to find joy in it. Military veterans discover America's great outdoors has some great powers. So I began a widespread study to determine where the pathogen was coming from and how it was getting to the marine environment. And crime scene investigators, the underwater edition, just what's killing this beautiful Elkhorn coral. All this and more now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart. Whether it's landscapes, water, or wildlife, <laughs> we'll take you to some places that will just take your breath away. And that magic happens every spring when hundreds of thousands of geese transform the countryside in Oregon. A story now on a migration that still has plenty of mystery in a story produced by Vince Patton for Oregon Field Guide. They're beautiful, especially when they're in huge flocks and flight and uh... They're in these big clouds that look like a snowstorm from, from a distance. It's just a cacophony of sounds. It's loud, it's, it's beautiful, because as the birds turn in and out of the sunlight, they almost change colors. You can go from these white birds to almost a, a black bird almost, and it's just beautiful to watch. They are so close together, you wonder why they don't run into each other. It is poetry in motion, it is fluid, it is undulating, it is a swarm, a huge swarm. You'll be forgiven if you think it might be snowing, but this blizzard blanketing the valley has a mind of its own. You get this whirling dervish of birds, it's just beautiful to watch. And, and the sheer numbers as well. Oregonians have a front row seat to one of the most astounding natural spectacles in the world of migratory birds. Hundreds of thousands of Arctic white geese come to Klamath Falls in late winter. Then they make their way to Summer Lake. And ultimately, by spring, they have reached Harney County, home of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. But most geese skip the refuge. Instead, they come to the farms right around the town of Burns, providing the easiest wildlife viewing opportunities you can imagine. My name is Kelly Hazen, and I'm a volunteer neckband reader on Arctic white geese. I come out during March and April and drive the roads around Burns using a spotting scope with a window mount usually. They're very accessible and they're very numerous. So it's pretty easy to come out and find the geese, look at them. They're very dependable. Um, I know their daily habits. The geese have a personal ambassador in Kelly Hazen of Burns. Oh, I've got it. Yeah, it's a Ross's goose, blue phase. She eagerly shares their stories during tours at the annual Migratory Bird Festival. Would you like to see a blue phase? I'd love to. Okay. More often, Kelly's out on her own, spending two to three hours a day during springtime acting as a citizen scientist. That's what I'd like to think of myself. I like to contribute to research about birds. And this is my 14th year of looking at neck bands. And I've read almost 1,500 neck bands. If she can read the code on the neck band, she'll report the sighting back to the researchers who banded the bird earlier in life. It's like an Easter egg hunt. You see the uh, color and you think, oh, I can see if I can, the challenge of can I read those three codes? And then, have I seen this bird a previous year? 
earlier this spring, I got to see a male Ross's goose that's over 20 years old. From um, records that I've been able to see, that would make that Ross's goose the third oldest Ross's goose recorded. There are great gaps of information between their wintering and summer grounds. I happen to be on the migration path between those two places. I tell you, it takes patience to <laughs> read these bands. <laughs> When conditions are good, there's hundreds of thousands of birds here. But they're right now, this is a good wet year, so there's, there's a flock over there, and there's a flock over there. They're scattered all over the basin. Gary Ivey used to be a biologist at the nearby Malheur Refuge. Tim Bodine manages the refuge now. They showed us the geese's favorite daytime resting spot, a place most wouldn't think of as wildlife habitat. They're roosting right here on our wastewater treatment plant in Burns, Oregon. So what makes Burns so much more popular than the refuge? The answer is easy, food. They're here to eat, that's what they're doing. They're headed north and they want to pack as much energy as they can on and head north. Basically they're flying cows, they love green grass and they're out there grazing and that's just really interesting to watch them in their activities foraging and interacting with each other. Geese are grazers, that, you know, that's what geese do. This tender young green, nutritious, delicious green is what they're after. And then you'll see sometimes some bugs in the manure that they're picking. And also under the manure is also some green growth because this is acting as organic fertilizer. Voracious swarms of geese love the ranches around birds. Susan Doverspike grows one hay crop a year and she loses a good bit of the early growth to the geese. We figure maybe a quarter, sometimes a third, depending on the kind of production year, that those birds just glean off the first growth part of the grass here. The birds come because they like our cattle management practices. Because we grow hay, we have fresh cut meadows every year. The birds like it. The birds like it in great quantities. So the combination of tender young grass that is readily available for the birds and the high nutritious bugs makes for a very palatable and nutritious diet for the birds on their migratory path and then they're ready to lay eggs when they reach their destination. Food is crucial at this stage in the lives of these geese. They may spend more than a month here bulking up because they're still not even halfway home. Well, we have the birds coming up from California, and they're coming here and they're making their stopovers, and some are going to Wrangell Island, which is off Russia, and all the way over to Hudson Bay. So you're looking at upwards of 3,000 miles that these birds are traveling to their breeding grounds. It's up in their Arctic nesting grounds where researchers catch the birds and place those neck bands that observers like Kelly in Oregon will read for years to come. The populations of white geese are so large that portions of the Arctic tundra face ecological peril. The land around Hudson Bay cannot support so many hundreds of thousands of geese. As a result, hunting limits have been increased, especially for the birds that migrate through the central U.S. The geese that come through Oregon are not quite so rampant. The flocks are large enough, though, it's easy to make the common mistake of calling them all snow geese. A lot of people think these are snow geese, and I tell them actually the majority of these birds are Ross's geese. The Ross's geese are about 40% smaller, and their bill is much smaller than the lesser snow geese. That's the way to tell the difference. And we'll get the other scope over here. While the average bird watcher may have trouble telling the birds apart, the geese themselves have a remarkable ability to keep their individual families together in the midst of these giant droves. With the lesser snow geese, the young travel with their parents two and sometimes three years in a row. They stay with their parents year round. They stay with their family. Earlier, I saw a mated pair of Ross's geese that I've seen in previous years, and they've been together at least seven years, documented. So that was a, a thrill for me to see that bird. Arctic geese mate for life. These loud, sociable birds even manage to keep their families together when the alarm cry goes out and the entire flock takes to the air again. And they keep track of them, each other in these flocks. I don't know how they do that. <laughs>
it could be their their voice. I don't know. And I never get tired of seeing it. Usually I look to see what caused the birds to take off. And most of the time it's an eagle flying nearby or an airplane. They're fleeing something that they're afraid of. And they are very gregarious birds and they want to stay together. From Burns to Klamath Falls, Oregon sits at the heart of the Pacific Flyway and the center of a dazzling display that repeats itself every spring. You know, it's one of those places where you stop along the road and sit and watch for a while just because it's something you don't see every day. That much wildlife in one place. They're beautiful. They are a joy to listen to. And there's not much you can do about them, so you have to enjoy them. Now, as a neckband reader, it's a little disappointing when they take off and I'm looking at the flock. But it is a natural wonder, a spectacle that can't be matched. The physical and mental stresses of war can take a huge toll on service members and their families, but there is healing power in nature and a bond amongst veterans that comes alive in the great outdoors. We join the Sierra Club's Stacey Bear on an adventure down the Colorado River, where veterans deepen their connection to the land and one another. We can start loading. Everybody's getting their last drips of civilization in before we head to the river. I'm Stacy Bear. I'm the Sierra Club's military family and veterans representative. Yeah, so I came home uh, in 2007 from Iraq. I had a huge cocaine habit. Uh, I struggled with suicidal ideation and a lot of depression. And I kept calling one of my buddies and he said, you got to do something about it. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do? So he's like, well, come rock climbing with me. And when I came off that climb, I felt so good. And I thought, man, this is something that, uh, that every veteran, every service member needs to have an opportunity to get outside and push themselves again. The Sierra Club in 2006 started the Military Family Outdoor Program. And the idea behind that program is you fought for the country, now get out and enjoy the country that you fought for. My name is Mark Latinsky uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a Marine infantryman and I served in Afghanistan. I was injured on uh, November 19th of 2010 on uh, a foot patrol in Saginaw, Afghanistan. I stepped on a pressure plate IED. I think it'll be probably the most physically demanding activity that I've done since being injured. He does a lot on his own. I'm Heather Latinsky, I'm an RN, and I'm married to Mark Latinsky. If you look at the drawing, I get so much pleasure and joy out of seeing him get back to life. And Mark and his wife are from Minnesota. Uh, they've been married for three and a half years now. And talking to him, there's not an ounce of anger. Grab a chair real quick. My name's Carrie Conway. I'm a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force. I was served in Afghanistan and Cuba. In Cuba, I broke my lower back. The plane crash, I broke up, I broke my neck. But I also damaged my brain a couple of times. The wheelchair came after I started having seizures every, pretty much every minute of the day. Carrie is an amazing story. Carrie is a pilot from New Hampshire. <laughs> and she's just battled through all this stuff and her goal is to be an Olympic swimmer. And, and after you hear her tell her story, it's kind of like being an Olympic swimmer. It seems like a goal almost not worthy enough for her because she's already done so much. Okay, all the warriors, let's have you over here. Everybody ready? On three, say go Army. One, two, three, go Army. I was going to say, boy, those are fighting words. Adios. Everything's pretty big out here. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm reconnecting to life, I guess. Out here in the desert, you don't have any clouds to look at, so we spend all our time staring at the rocks. Sweet fire right there. We thought we were going to be paddling, like it is. 
year ago last spring, I was listening to National Public Radio, and they were interviewing a young Marine, Mark Latinsky. Now, I'm Fred Solheim. I'm from Boulder, Colorado. I started this effort a year ago, and here he was in an interview, upbeat, forward-looking. So I thought, I'd like to take him on a raft trip, and I think if we had him on a raft trip, he is an inspiration, and I thought we'd get a lot out of it, more than he would. If I can just get a little bit about uh, every person. Mark Latinsky from Minneapolis. The Sierra Club is now sponsoring 12 wounded warriors down here, along with three therapists to assess the benefits. We have Marines, we have an Air Force lieutenant, we have Army, and we have three Brits, actually. They're the equivalent of Marines in, in Great Britain. I'm Krabby. I'm from um, South England. It's not the river trip. It's um, what comes out of it. These guys get to know each other, and last year they got hooked up on Facebook and email. Hey, you guys want to get on, on this fire line? And I ended up getting four MRIs. From you know, they can share their anxieties, their successes. They can talk and love with them. They couldn't have ever talked to a therapist. <laughs> Lacking that, how about breakfast? What do you want? Come and get it! Breakfast! We will hit rapids today. Yes, that's good. <laughs> In the military, you know, the camaraderie comes from working together to achieve a common goal, and you've got to trust in one another to get the job done. And it's the same thing outside. You've got to work together, trust each other, trust the boat captain, trust your equipment. So everybody has their role to play. Everybody has to pick up a little bit of the slack. <laughs> we had a number of different issues. Boats getting stuck on a rock. We lost an engine. And it actually, I think, allowed the group to really bond together. You never come away from a river trip or a climbing trip unchanged. The river always teaches you something. Swimming in the Colorado River, floating down that, I ended up staring at this for most of the day. I mean, it's just simple stuff that when you're pretty sure you're going to die, this ends up being pretty awesome. And this is just so overwhelming. Everything's just so much bigger. And time on the river just to spend time with you crazy Americans is pretty cool too, like. It's just nice to get away from the big city and come down here and see the, the Red Rock skyscrapers. I think that uh, keeping areas like this, it's absolutely necessary. There are people on this trip who are certainly in the red state side, and there are people who are on the blue state side. But the river is a really unifying factor. Why do they want to protect this place? Because they use it. Because they, it's a beautiful place. I think we need to be broader about our the way we think about conservation. And on the one hand, bringing our service members and veterans out here it's helping to conserve our veterans. It's helping to conserve this national resource. We have 18 veterans a day committing suicide right now, according to some statistics, maybe even more. What are we doing to conserve that national resource? What are we doing to conserve these beautiful ecosystems and where all of our water comes from for the Southwest? And so combining those two, I think, is how we can move things forward. I think maybe he's trying to dig his way out of this whole experience. <laughs> moving that forward. In a couple years, you're going to see Carrie bringing other people outside. 
the experience overall kind of solidified my goals of getting into competitive swimming and getting to the Olympics. I've actually been through a whole hell of a lot and my life isn't over yet. And I've, it's not over, period. I still have a lot to do. The plan is to... Uh, yeah, a river rock guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll go back to college, hopefully get a degree in uh, forestry or wildlife management. You're going to see Mark as a, as a game and fish warden in Minnesota. Guys like Mark, he's making it out here. He's not, he doesn't have any excuses. So what are our excuses? Some updates now on other stories we're following. Beekeepers and some environmental groups want the Environmental Protection Agency to ban the pesticide clothianidin. It's one of a class of chemicals they say is lethal to bee immune systems and likely contributes to colony collapse disorder. That disorder has devastated honeybee populations since 2006, mysteriously causing all the adult honeybees in a colony to disappear or die. Bees pollinate about a third of all crops in the United States, with an economic impact in the billions of dollars. There's new evidence about the long-term damage from the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists now know that the 2010 explosion harmed some species that are seldom seen, deepwater corals and brittle starfish that live 4,000 feet beneath the water's surface. Researchers found coral communities about seven miles from the Deepwater Horizon site, covered in a thick brown material, showing signs of tissue damage. Tests confirmed that the fingerprint of the oil on the corals was from the spill and not from natural seepage. The explosion unleashed about 160 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. Not far from the site of that oil disaster, scientists are tracking another threat to coral reefs. It's taken a lot of detective skills to get to the bottom of white pox disease. Miles O'Brien explains in our Science Nation report. What it looks like here is rocks out in the ocean because what looks like a rock is actually dead coral. The living Elkhorn coral is actually bright orange in color. Rollins College biologist Catherine Sutherland does her detective work underwater, tracking a coral killer. The past 15 years or so, we've seen a 90% decline of Elkhorn coral in the Florida Keys and similar declines elsewhere in the Caribbean. This is me uh, diving on Lou Key Reef. These are needleless syringes that are being used to collect the surface mucus layer. With support from the National Science Foundation, Sutherland is investigating white pox disease. Using some CSI tools, she's traced the culprit to a human source. This is the first example of a human pathogen infecting a marine organism. I determined that the pathogen of white pox is Serratia marcescens, which is a bacterium. And I knew that Serratia marcescens was a pathogen found in human waste. And so I began a widespread study to determine where the pathogen was coming from and how it was getting to the marine environment. Proper wastewater treatment kills the bacteria. But Sutherland suspects the microbe infecting nearby reefs is leaking from septic tanks. So we have a genetic fingerprint of the Serratia marcescens that comes from diseased coral, and it matches the genetic fingerprint of the Serratia marcescens that comes from uh, untreated sewage. Sutherland says officials in the Keys are working to move more residents onto city sewage systems to protect the clean waters that attract tourists to the area. So if we can bring all the sewage in the Florida Keys through these wastewater treatment plants, we can certainly eliminate a source of this pathogen. And it's been very expensive. Uh, it costs over $900 million at this point and rising, uh, but it's taxpayers' money well spent. And the people of Key West recognize it. They have their advanced wastewater treatment. The people in the remainder of the Florida Keys recognize that the coral reefs are their livelihood. It's actually a $3 billion a year industry for tourism in that region. And so in in order to protect that economics of the Florida Keys, they need to maintain good water quality and treating the sewage is a huge step in that direction. Marine biology student Hunter Noren has seen firsthand the devastation of white pox disease. These corals are really important because they protect the reefs. And without them, the wave action will just destroy the more delicate corals. 
the state of Elkhorn and the Keys right now is it's sobering. And we'll be monitoring these individual coral colonies over the five-year period of this study. And so we can see how the microbial community changes over that long time period as well as over short time periods because we'll be returning to these reefs at least two times per year. Elkhorn coral is now protected under the Endangered Species Act. Sutherland says if we can cut off the spread of white pox disease at the source, that will go a long way toward giving these important ocean creatures a chance at recovery. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Here's a look at a story we're working on for a future show. Lionfish from Asian waters have invaded the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, crowding out native species like snapper and grouper. The Indo-Pacific lionfish is a perfect invader in the Atlantic. It has no natural predators. It reproduces very quickly. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at This American Land, we'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation and the Turner Foundation.